Hey weirdos, it's wrap up time. So today I'm going to be doing my May wrap up. I am Emma Abe and I'm so excited that you guys are here on this channel today. I'm very excited because I've read a total of 14 books this month, which was really fun. Five of those were for the booktube prize and that whole thing has been really fun. There's another four that I did for the Asian readathon, which I will do more of a wrap up for the things that I did that weren't book related at the end of this video. So let's just get straight into the books I read. So the first book I read was The Body by Bill Bryson. And this is a book that attempts to summarize kind of everything about the human body, all of the little, all of the functionings to different aspects of the human body and all the way to kind of how the body breaks down slash deals with things. There's a little bit at the end about death and that process and how the body breaks down to the point you die, like the actual science behind that. And I was a huge fan of this book at the beginning. I was eating all of it up. I really like human biology. I took a human biology class in high school and that was so much fun. Essentially starts off by taking a different part of the body, say your lungs, your immune system, your brain, and it goes through all of the different parts in not overwhelming detail, but in enough detail where it will satiate that appetite and spur you to go read more about the different parts of the book. Where it kind of lost me a little bit at the end was it got a little bit preachy because it all started to talk about how we don't exercise enough, how we sit down too much, and how we destroy our bodies through food, which I get there is a market for that. I just didn't really want it in this book. There's also a part that was really interesting where it talked about diseases and immune diseases, and it briefly talks about how underprepared we are for our next pandemic and it references the spanish flu and i just kind of was sitting there and was like yep everything you said was true here we are in the next pandemic and this book came out i believe either in 2018 or 2019 so it's very t weirdly timed other than that like i really enjoyed it for the most part for the first parts of the book i really wish it had sticked more towards that it did also go into like aging and what happens to your body when you age all those sorts of things which i didn't really like that as much i really just wanted it to be solely focused on looking at different parts of the body and just explaining those parts of the body and limiting its scope to that. It was really good in the parts where I really liked it and still was good in the parts where I wasn't into it as much. It, that was just more of my personal taste thing. So I think I'm going to leave this at like a four out of five because I did love those parts of that were the parts that I wanted it to be as much as I did and the parts that I didn't like as much were still good. It just was my personal taste that I wasn't into it as much. The next book I have for you is The Mark of Athena by Rick Riordan. This is the third book in the Heroes of Olympus book series and I'm reading this because the newest book in the Trials of Apollo won the Goodreads Choice Awards and I figured to read that book I need to read all of the books that came before it at least in the Greek universe. I really enjoyed this one. I really like this. I really like where it went with the characters and I really like Annabeth as a character, so I really love the exploration that it did into that. And I love in that in this one, everything started breaking down a little bit more. Like stuff had started to break down, especially with the gods and their personalities clashing with each other. But I think this book is really where all of that sort of shit hits the fan. And it's the book where you have everyone has their memories back. The, the Roman demigods and the Greek demigods that we met past two books really get to interact and work as a team as a cohesive unit of seven that's gonna fulfill this new prophecy and i really liked their interactions it was really interesting to see what was going on between the reveal that happened in the last book in terms of one of who one of these characters looked like see how that paid off felt like that was a little bit disappointing personally i was like if you're gonna go there, go there. But instead it was like, oh, this person just looks like this other person. And I was like, well, that's kind of sad. But also these books really aren't those relationship melodrama thing. In this book series, when you have two people set up as 
the people who are going to be uh, a couple, those are most likely the two people that are going to stay the couple for the entire book series. I don't find an issue with that at all. I think that's fine. You know, again, I really love Annabeth. So I really love that it focused a lot on her. I was really sad when she got separated from everyone else, but I kind of understand why they did that. And I like that they all kind of came together back at the end. Again, I think this kind of suffers from something that I said about in the earlier books that if you know the Greek myths, you kind of know who these big bads are, especially because Rick Ryder does such a good job about setting stuff up. So like Annabeth doesn't really like spiders because Athena and Arachne have beef. You kind of get an idea for like what's going to happen in this book. To me it wasn't shocking at all personally because I knew those Greek. The hints that were dropped, if you knew the hints, would help you come to the conclusion of what the reveal is or who the big bad is. But I guess that's nice. It's like a reward for people who have done the research and who know the Greek myths but it's also irritating. <laughs> I feel like it's also irritating because I do know those Greek myths because it's just like, I don't feel like there's any twists and turns, but I still like it. I still like what is being done with these Greek myths. I love the reimaginings in terms of how they would function in like today's society. I think that is one of the strong points for this book series. I read this on audiobook and following along. This I think I'm also going to give a four. Because the next book I read was Bridges of Madison County by Robert James Waller and this I started reading I think last month but I didn't actually get to finish it before my loan for the audiobook for this went out and I could have finished it like with following along but I didn't have the energy to do it so I decided to wait for the audiobook to get back off of hold for me. I read this in like fury of trying to read four books in three days and I was mostly successful. I got three of the four books done and that was like the Mark of Athena, this one and the next one. Feelings about this book are really complicated because I like it but I also like don't really care for it. Like I wasn't like too invested in the story. It's literally slow burn romance. I don't know it's really weird to like discuss and it's very like sexual at times. When I was reading it I walked over to my mom and I was like very weirdly erotic. Not in the way that you think it would be. See, and I don't really think that I am the correct age demographic for this book. It's a little bit of like an escapist story where you have this woman trapped in this loveless marriage and then she meets this man and it's a fleeting romance for like a week and when she meets him she feels alive in ways that she'd never felt like with her husband but she does feel such an obligation to her husband and her children that she doesn't leave. It was kind of heartbreaking like in the end. I just don't think that like this is written for me. I don't feel like I've experienced enough life to connect to this book. I feel like the world is open to so many possibilities for me and that are so exciting that I don't feel trapped anywhere like the main protagonist does. It's just a weird thing to try and like connect to because I've not lived enough life to have experienced the types of emotions that the main couple are going through. I haven't been stuck in a relatively loveless marriage for like the past 20 years. You know, I've, I've only lived 20 years. Maybe this will be a, like a good thing for me to revisit in 20 years. I still think it's really good and I think if you're in that age demographic you should really read this because it is just really really well the whole like weirdly erotic feelings that I got from this was solely through the writing it wasn't through what was being described so I read this audiobook and following along I think I'm gonna give it about a four next we have Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier this this is the first book that I've read of Daphne du Maurier and she's as everyone kind of calls her, like booktube's darling. I don't really know what else is in her work. I'm gonna be honest, like this book had me clueless for so long. I was reading it and I was like, I don't get it. I don't get why everyone raves about this book. And then I got two thirds of the way through just kind of having the same feeling. And then sort of the plot picks up. It was a little bit frustrating to me because once the plot picked up I did enjoy that part. I just don't like that it's all condensed into the last third of the book. To be fair I did have like everything spoiled for me. I do think it kind of benefits if you don't have everything spoiled for you so I'm not really going to spoil it for you but essentially you have this woman who marries Mr. De Winter and 
he has just come off from losing his first wife, Rebecca. The whole idea is that this second wife is so overshadowed by the ghost of Rebecca, not literally, which I liked. I like that there was no paranormal shenaniganery going on. I don't tend to like that in books because I think it's kind of stupid. Unless you take it to out of a realistic setting and take it to a completely fantasy setting, then I'm more into it. When it's like this and it's like hyper realism, I'm not into it at all. I don't like ghost stories. I think it's bullshit. And I thought the whole idea of just the legacy of Rebecca and the expectations that people have for this new wife was really interesting. I just think that there could have been way less of that in the book. Don't care about social life's daily comings and goings and their social engagements. So I think I'm going to leave this at like a three out of five. I think I might try more of Daphne du Maurier's books because I, I did like like her writing. It was interesting. I would just zone out for large periods of the book and just would continue the book and it was like nothing ever happened. And I also didn't feel like the beginning two thirds that were just plotting around, it didn't do a good job of like introducing us to life in the culture of the time. I felt like that was kind of a waste as well. The next book I read was Charged, Overzealous Prosecutors, The Quest for Mercy and the Fight to Transform Criminal Justice in America by Emily Bazelon. And I read this for the Book 2 Prize. This was the second book I read for the Book 2 Prize. And I think I will point you to my Book 2 Prize vlog to get my full thoughts on it. Basically, I felt like this could have benefited from some editing or at least some writing choices that were a little bit different because it felt like it was unfocused. That being said, it's still really well researched. It's still a really important story. So if you're all interested in learning about injustices in the American justice system, then I would point to that book. I did wind up ranking this number six. I don't think it is a terrible book. I think it's a good book. I would recommend it to you. I, it was the weakest out of the bunch that I got. Okay, now we get to talk about The Good Winner of China by Shinran. Oh my god! I have been waiting to read this book since November and I am so glad I freaking read this because it's so good. I love, essentially, you have the author, Xin Ren, and she was a radio host and she would get all of these messages from women from all over China telling their stories. And she turned that into this book. And I really loved it because she takes vignettes from all over China, from wealthy to dirt poor women and their experiences. And it was so good because she doesn't just, she doesn't just tell their stories. She also talks about how their story affected her, how she came across their story, all of these things. And I just think Shinran did such a good job at making this book. And I think more people should read it. So for me, this got a five out of five easily. I will say trigger warnings for a bunch of stuff. Grief, sexual assault, all of that stuff. It's not good. There are really vivid and depressing depictions of terrible things that have happened. The first chapter, it hits you with a major whammy and it made me uncomfortable, so uncomfortable. And I mildly thought about putting it down, but I also knew that this book was going to be good. So I needed to keep reading it. I really liked the discussion with the university student. That was really interesting. I will say that this book is a little bit outdated because it does talk about lesbians and it does say that it is illegal to be gay slash LGBTQ in China. That is not correct. It's now, it's not illegal. It has been decriminalized, but it is still not legal to get married. That really has nothing to do with the social acceptance of being LGBTQ in China. That is a whole other bucket of worms. I read this for the Asian readathon as an excuse to read this. I didn't really read it to fulfill any specific prompt, but it could fulfill the prompts of, I think, like reading someone who has something similar and different to you. Similar to me that the author and I are both women and different because I am not Chinese. Not enough people talk about this book. I also read this with my eyeballs because this does not have an audiobook. 
Okay, next book that we are doing is How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kennedy. And this I also read for the BookTube prize. I really liked it. Again, I will point you to that video. Just go watch that video. Long story short, really enjoyed it. It hit a lot of the spots that I wanted it to. He does a really good job explaining terms, which I think is really, really important. Yeah, and this ultimately got ranked third out of all of the books that I read. So yes, I really enjoyed it. I recommend it to basically everyone who wants to get uh, understand the complexities of racism in America and uh, sort of race politics, all of that stuff. Really good, really good discussions. Highly recommend it. I am dying to get myself an actual copy of this book and I've been meaning to for a while. So we don't know what's going to happen. We'll see what happens when COVID is over. This next book I read is just this cute little tiny thing about the nature of the Chinese character. Gifts from the Earth by Barbara Aria and Calligraphy by Russell and Gong. This was a cute little book about different Chinese characters and it's very like surface level. It doesn't really go too deep into the history of any of the characters. Kind of wisp wish it went more into that. Some of the characters get a really good history and background of how the character became that way and sort of like what the calligraphy is really supposed to represent and some of them don't. I understand that the evolution of Chinese characters is very complicated and messy. Not all of them have a nice through line. I kind of wish that it went a little bit deeper but otherwise, for what it was, it was fine. I think it would get like a three out of five stars. I did get a massive like light bulb moment when I figured out that that the Chinese for moon is Yue. Recently, I've been rewatching Avatar Last Airbender. So if you know anything about that, you know why mind explode. Um, essentially, you get an entire character's arc ruined. And I was just like, wow. Anyway, that's what I took away from this book. <laughs> and I read this with my eyeballs. This next book I read is Underland, A Deep Time Journey by Robert McFarlane. And this I also read for the booktube prize. I really enjoyed this. It is so sciencey and that you guys know that that is my jam. I really enjoyed it. There, my feelings about this book are just, I love it. <laughs> really good things about it. Love all of the research that went into it. You guys can tell well-researched things plus really good writing is always a win and this had both of those. I really like that it didn't just stick to facts and figures. It also talked about the author's journey in doing the research for all of this stuff and he actually gets hands-on experience experiencing these different things which is always great because I have an issue with people who just look up things on Google and then decide to decide to write books about it. At least go to some archives, okay? Don't just look things up on Google. And this just really good quality. I really liked it. Unfortunately, there's a bunch of really good books that I had to read for the booktube prize. And this ultimately wound up getting fifth. Still really recommend it. So yeah, go check out that video if you want lots of extra thoughts. I read this with the audiobook and following along and I'm so happy I have a hard copy of this. The next book I read is Solitary by Albert Wood Fox and this again is another thing for the booktube prize. So video, description, cards, probably, I don't know. If you don't know, this is a story about a man who was locked up in solitary confinement for a crime he didn't commit. He was in jail for a crime he did commit though. He admits that because he was young and stupid. It is a mind-boggling story, it is a heart-wrenching story, and the whole time I was just like, the fuck, the fuck, the fuck, why couldn't people see the bullshittery that was happening? I read that with audiobook only because I don't actually have a hard copy of this, but yeah, it was really good, and this one actually wound up snagging my number one spot for the booktube prize. So it was really good. Really enjoyed it. Please go read it. You guys know that memoirs typically are not my thing. This is a memoir. That was my thing. This next book I read is Sweetness and Lightning by Guido Amagakure. And this is a manga and I read this because of the Asian readathon. Yes, this was a weird book. One thing that I do like that it has, it has recipes in there. So if you want to make the delicious dishes that they talk so much about, I got hungry so many times reading this book because so many d delicious dishes. I was just like, I just want good food. Uh... 
whole time. There are recipes so you, you can make them yourself if you want to. I will say the relationship between the dad and the daughter was really cute. One thing I was really worried about going into this was the grief. If you don't know, this is about a father and a daughter, and the father, uh, they've recently lost the mother. There's only 12 of these. One thing that has really been like making me go like, the whole time I was reading it was the relationship between the father and uh, a student. So essentially the reason why it's all about cooking is because the father is shit at cooking. He goes to like this restaurant one day and the restaurant is like owned by the student's family and so the student's just like well I'll try making something and they figure out hey this is a great system we work well together my daughter really likes you, let's keep making food together. And that's really all it stays at. It stays at a really like platonic level, except it's weird the way they talk about it. The whole time they'll like be at school and they'll be like sneaking around to like talk to each other. Also, she has his phone number. That is like a no-no in terms of American education. You do not give your phone number to your students. Their whole relationship made me feel really uncomfortable. It doesn't cross the line but it's getting close to the line. It's flirting with the line and I don't like that. Student-teacher relationships are stuff I hate. I don't like that at all. It's too weird. It's too creepy. I don't like it. I'm not sure if I am going to continue reading this manga or not. It really depends on if I can gain access to it. If I have to work hard to gain access to it, I'm probably not going to finish it. But if I don't, and it's easy to gain access to it, I might finish it. I read this with my eyeballs because this does not have an audiobook because it's a manga. The next book I read is Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, A Therapist, Her Therapist, and Our Lives Revealed by Lori Gottlieb. This is the last book I read for the booktube prize this month. <laughs> Yay, we finally got to it. So again, you know where to go. Short version, I really like this. I really like the insights into therapy that you got. So essentially it's this therapist and it's this weird memoir thing where she talks about her own experiences getting over this relationship that really hurt her but then turns out to be about more than just that. She also talks about her therapy patients and I think story the patients and her story all really work well together and it's nice to see them learning like from each other. I really enjoyed it. It was very powerful at moments. There's one person in the book that I did not like at the beginning and boy did my mind change about that person at the end and I actually ranked this number two. So yeah, if that tells you any idea of how I liked it, it was just a really weirdly like personal thing to me as to why I read this and kind of helped me understand that you don't really need to lose someone to need to go into therapy. I did read it with audiobook, not following along because I don't have the actual copy. This next book I read was like probably the favorite book I read this entire month. It was so good. And that is Wild Swans, Three Daughters of China by Jung Chang. Oh my god, I love this so much. This is really long. It's deceptively short. It's over 500 pages. Just be aware of that. There is a reason that is this is on so many people's list of books you should read about China. Trust me, I looked it up. Look out for that video in the future. This, I chose this for the Asian Readathon as really just an excuse to read books about China. This did something really interesting where it talks about the author's grandmother and mother and herself. And it was such an interesting view into how China has changed so much, starting from the early 1900s with her grandmother, when you have the sort of end of imperialism and the beginning and the rise of communism in China. And that whole story was so interesting and I loved seeing it from an insider's point of view. It was different than the Son of the Revolution, which I read because that was just like one person's life. So you only get like his experience with it. And it's more of focusing on the Cultural Revolution where this starts way before that and continues a little bit beyond that. And I think it was really interesting to where the person in the Son of the Revolution was a little bit of an outsider. This is definitely from insiders. Her mother was an active member of the party, as was her father. That is how they met. Her mother was a little bit labeled, her grandmother was a little bit labeled as an imperialist. I really love how the title connects. It's very important in, in her family, which I really uh, appreciated it because 
my family kind of does a similar thing. One of the things I loved the most was like the beginning of the book where you learn about her grandmother and it really was like the, you know, kind of fall of like imperialist China and the rise of communist China. And it was so interesting to look at how it changed so much. And that was a period of Chinese history that I don't really know that much about. Not that I know a bunch about Chinese history because I don't trying and learning. I really liked when we got to the author, her section. That was really interesting. All of it was so interesting because each of the women in this family are all very different and unique. Their stories are all very different. There was a large emphasis on the author's childhood, which I think is very important because a lot of shit went down in that time period. You know, have everything from like the famines in China to the cultural revolution to China opening up back again. But all of that stuff was happening like in her lifetime and it just was so interesting so good if you are interested in Chinese history first of all really good if you're interested in like China and how that intersects with women's roles that was also very very interesting in this as well you could do you could do a whole like feminist reading and lens on this book if you like family dramas that sort of thing I mean this is a non-fiction so I think it lends itself really well if you like that sort of thing I loved it read it Wild Swan, five out of five. Hmm, so good. Last book, I promise. House of Hades by Rick Riordan. This is the last book I've read this month, and technically the month isn't over yet, but do I think I'm gonna finish a book in two days? No, I don't have the motivation to do that. So this is the fourth book in the Heroes of Olympus series, and one mistake I made going into this book was thinking it was the last book in the series. It's not. Thank goodness, because I was reading this and I'm like, how is this gonna come together to a nice big conclusion? Big whoop, you have a whole other book to go through, Emma Abe. Jesus. I'm gonna be honest, this book was a little bit of a slog to get through. I was not feeling it the same way I was feeling the other book. I think it's partly because the main cast of the seven people, they were all split up. I think also might have been hindered from the fact that I just finished Wild Swans and I loved Wild Swans. This is still good. I just had such a hard time basically giving a f halfway through I was like well, I don't really understand why they have to go to the fucking house of Hades anymore I know they need to shut the doors to like keep the monsters from going in but it would just I did not care <laughs> I don't know I don't know what it was I like what's going on with coach Hedge though that's cute I like that idea what they did with Tartarus I like the stuff going on with Nico although honestly Nico's angsty face it's just <sighs> little bit irritating. I liked him more at the beginning of the series just because I felt like he was more of like a wise figure that was helping out character. I'm not gonna DNF the series. I'm gonna keep going. It just I felt like this is kind of like the dud and it kind of sucks because I'm kind of excited for it. Honestly I felt like I kept forgetting like what the crew on the Argo was trying to do. <laughs> One of like just the biggest issues I had was I just felt like I kept forgetting what the point of this book was. And I didn't feel like the climax of this was very interesting at all. Again, one of the things I'm liking about this book series in general is how it's intersecting different cultural traditions with Greek mythology. I want it to do that more. There's a little bit of that when it comes to ghosts in Chinese mythology. My heart wasn't in it. I think I'm going to give it a three. Kind of disappointing. End to my reading month. Now we are going to talk about the other stuff I did for the Asian Readathon. I said I was going to watch Eat Man 2. That did not happen. <laughs> my heart just was not into in it. But I did rewatch The Cook the Foodra. That was good. I loved it. It's so cute. It's so cute. One thing I did kind of realize that maybe I should not be watching the more modern Chinese dramas because some moments in Cook the Foodra was just hitting me different than the way they hit me when I first watched it and I was like this is too real I cannot I cannot right now I need to go away and lie down <laughs> I've watched it with my mother and she loved it we started calling it the Yan Mo show because Yan Mo is one of the characters and she couldn't pronounce Zhao Yi or Hao Wu Yi or Zhao Guo Shao <laughs> <laughs> she was like, yeah, well, it's the only one I can do. And it also doesn't help that the title is in French. And then this month, a really interesting thing happened to me this month because this month became like the month of Chinese dramas. I started watching 
whole bunch of new ones. I finished a couple. So I'm going to kind of talk about those a little bit. If you want me to talk more about Chinese dramas, let me know and I'll make a video. Why not? I'm going to do a quick kind of rundown of ones that I've watched. So I watched Ashes of Love, the entirety of it, got sucked in so fast, finished it in like four days. It was insane. There was lots of nights where I did not get a lot of sleep. And so that is in like the wuxia genre. And I really like that genre. I'm really into it. Big fan. It's kind of like fantasy. It, it incorporates lots of Taoist and Buddhist um, and traditional Chinese elements, which I'm really liking. I'm making my mom watch that with me right now. And she's just like, she's not a big fantasy person in the first place. So it's a little bit of a stress for her, but I'm glad she is liking it. She actually wound up starting calling this one the Yanma show too, that I've heard rumors that there's going to be like a season two. And I'm just like, mind explode. I would love that. But I also don't know how I'd love that because it's like, it's a story. It's a complete story. I don't know if I want more. It's very like romance heavy. So if you don't really like romance, then don't really go for it. Uh, my favorite character in that is Renew. He is my favorite. I love him so much. Solely for the fact that the actor is fucking phenomenal. Jesus fucking Christ. Duh, the things he does. Like the emoting he can do with his hands. I just, my heart melts for him. This show just makes me like, I, I think about it and I just want to be like, fo hua, fo hua. It means phoenix in Chinese. It's one of the things that the character Jinmi says a lot. Ugh, my heart melts for this show. Then I watched Eternal Love or 10 Miles of Peach Blossoms, whatever you want to call it. I really like that one too. That one took me more time to get into that because the main two like love interests it took a while for them to like meet and start interacting. I loved them. They were so cute. I read online that the person who plays Ye Hua thought that he wasn't attractive enough. And I was like, you are beautiful. Leave yourself alone. You're wonderful. <laughs> That's also in the wuxia genre. Apparently there's the sequel Eternal Love of Dream or the pillow book. And I've just started getting into that. It's taking me some time because I'm not really sure what's going on story wise in terms of when things take place. So it's taking me a bit. It's taking me a bit. But they have a bunch of the actors who played the same characters returning. Some of them are different, which threw me for a loop. A large loop. I'm only in like the second episode. There's a long way to go. I started watching the story of Young Sith Palace. I'm over halfway through in that and I'm loving it. Wailing Lo is awesome. I love her so much. She is the reason that I kept watching it in the beginning when it was really, really slow. I was like, I want to see what Wailing Lo does because she is so smart. She is so crafty. I just want to see how she gets herself out of situations. Love the Emperor. Love the Empress. They're so good. Love Fu Cha Fu Hung. He's really good too. His acting is just right now it's with what's going on. It's just melting my heart. I'm just like, Fu Cha Fu Hung, I just want to give you a hug and snuggle you because your character just needs it. I'm worried about him. And after I finish that, I plan on watching Young Si Princess Adventures because that's on Netflix and that's like the sequel follow up thing. And Wailing Lo's in it. I'm so excited. <laughs> I love her character. I can't wait to see what happens. Other one I'm working on right now is The Untamed. I'm watching that with my brother because my brother's kind of like, I don't want to watch something if there's no gay shit in it. And I was like, well, welcome to the genre of boys love. It was literally like the number one drama in China. And I'm just like, I'm only six episodes in. I'm so excited to see what happens. It's so cute. And I love it. My brother and I theorizing over here, like the, the Lan clan, it's like only gays. <laughs> they only let in gays just because of like the looks that happen between the characters. It's just like the sexual tension you can cut with a freaking knife. Okay, goodbye. I'm gonna end this video. It's probably really long. I had a fun time this month. I'm really excited for next month and getting more reading done. Okay, goodbye. I need to go to bed. The British... Oh my god, the braided... The... Um, um, yeah, and all these.